Patty, turn it off. Patty, turn it off. Patty, turn it off. That's me. I don't know if you hear it there. Okay, Patty turned it off. Okay. Harry, you're going to need to project. All you need to put Kakale. <laughs> wow. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. <laughs> Here they come, everybody. Oh. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning. Bonjour. Hello. Sorry, I'm in the dark. <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour. Coming in. They're coming in. <laughs> How many people have we got? Lots. 89. All right. I'm looking for uh, Wow. <laughs> I am in the dark. It's multiple, this is the most I've ever seen. It's like four okay. cases. Four cases. <laughs> Good morning to you, Cara. <laughs> yeah, for, for Cara, it is 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. It's 6 a.m. for Cara. It's 3 p.m. for us. Um, I don't know what you guys can hear. I, I'm going to come down. See so everybody's having your espresso. Yes. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. So welcome, everybody. This is the first time we have ever held a pre-midi uh, on Zoom at the same time live in the Café de la Marie in Paris. Um, we have about uh, three, five, about 20 people here, I guess. No, 15, so, so. Live people who are brave enough, with and without masks, <laughs> to be here uh, so that we can experience this. We are having technical difficulties on our end, so my, my boom speaker is not working, and that means that everyone here is going to have to be really quiet while Kara speaks. But I'd really like to um, hold an open forum before Kara Black speaks, to hold an open forum so everybody can kind of talk. You can unmute yourselves. You can say hello. You can see who's online. Um, you can see who's in the room. And just kind of get to feel comfortable and familiar for a few minutes before we start the program. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the weather in Paris today? Weather is beautiful, cool, <clears throat> um, about mid 70s, sunny. Lovely. Right. You Love, yes. Yes. Okay, you heard from the crowd. Anybody have questions for the crowd that's here? Wish I was there. Unmute, <laughs> <laughs> unmute so we can see you mm. and hear you. Oh, how many people normally come? One. Call out where you're from. Uh, David Kagan, West Palm Beach, Florida. Who oh, what? Mary Johnson, Lawrence, Kansas. All right. I'm in Delaware. Captain Audrey Riddle in Delaware. Wow. Lynn, Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Judy in Arizona. Myra from Georgia. David and Sherry in Kansas City, Missouri. Wow. Wow. Oh. Lynn from Brooksville, Florida. Dolly, New York. California, <laughs> California, Southern California. Oh, so you're Dolly, in California. Okay. And Lynn, San Francisco. Gwen from Delray Beach, Florida. Joanne Wilson from on, uh, Belleville, Ontario, Canada. Fabulous. And Jane, Jane and Justine from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I see, yeah. I see Aaron, Aaron, well, 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 I know well. that you're usually here. Like I see Eileen Walker. Hello. Eileen, why aren't you here? <laughs> Amy, I'm, I'm actually in Paris. I'm, I'm Paris. <laughs> Some of you are actually in Paris, but just across town, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Come on, Marilee, Yael. You guys normally you'd be here. From Paris. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm Ann Daniel. I'm in Florence, but Florence, Massachusetts. <laughs> Ann, but you're, we miss you, Ann. I miss you. 
Oh no. Okay. And so, um, how many? Oh, I don't know. I can't. I can't do a hands up. Maybe I can do a hands up. Have actually come to après midi before. I have. Hi, my name is Costanza. I'm. I live in Paris, but I'm in Sardinia right now. Wow. Oh wow. Hmm. I love it's 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 um my family i have family here i i i have a lot of family in italy so i'm constantly between france and italy and i love listening Fantastic. to talia corner i was okay so now i have another question okay how many of you have never been to an après midi and this is your first time me 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 <laughs> I don't want to turn it off. Okay, and how many of you are readers of Carol Black? Yes. 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 And that yes. is here, right? So yes. absolutely. Adrian, who's with you? Who's there with you? Oh, why don't everybody say hello? Who are in the room? Say hello. Start. Hi, I'm Mark from Los Angeles. Craig from Paris. Craig Carlson, pancakes in Paris. Great. Hi, Craig. You can't see anybody. Sharon Paris. Hi, Patty. Sharon Hi. Corman. Janet Hallstrand. Janet Hallstrand. Yeah, author. Oh. Wow. Great. Betty from Arlington, Virginia, but she's here, okay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. April and Paris. April and Paris. Summer, summer and Paris. <laughs> Ella from Nice. Hello, Cecily. I just sent you a text. Ella from Nice. How are these people getting into France? Yes, that's the question. They live there. They live there. All right. So I'm sorry you can't see everybody here. They're all kind of like surrounded, you know, surrounding me. I'm at the middle table for those of you who know what their, our system is kind of like. And you probably hear a lot of background noise because there's traffic. It's, you know, it's Paris. There's a lot going on. There's the cafe downstairs. They're probably listening to us thinking, what the hell is going on up there? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, I don't know. Should we get started? Is everybody yes. ready to talk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. In that case, I suggest that everybody mute yourselves. Okay. Mute your mics. So we can give Kara the uh, floor. And Patty, you are recording this, right? Okay, it's cool. We're being we're recording this so we can actually run this on the uh, on our uh, website. Okay, if that's okay with everybody. And I'm gonna put my speaker view. And now, uh, Kara. Bonjour. Bonjour, everybody. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. And I'm so sorry I'm not there with you, which I would have been, you know, if it, you know, wasn't COVID. And I'm sure a lot of you would have been there as well. Can you hear me? Can you hear well, me? The, everyone else hears you better than we hear you, unfortunately, because uh, my boom my boom speaker is not working. We haven't been able to figure that out. So they're listening from my silly little computer. But, okay. but, but, okay. Can you hear her? Can you hear? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. And Adrian, I would be there with you. And I'm really sorry because I just got a WhatsApp from my friend, Carla, our friend, Carla, who lives on the just next street. Right, Rue de Bretagne, and she said, oh, I would, I'm teaching today, otherwise I would have come, but um, normally I would have come. And, uh, hi, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Turn yours off. <laughs> and thank you for coming, everyone. When the sun rises, you'll be able to see some of the smoke from our fires here in California. 
But anyway, um, I'm really, really honored to be there. And I'm hoping to come to Paris whenever I can get on a flight. Right. I've heard people in the background saying, how do those people get to Paris? Um, so how are you people in the cafe? Do you live in Paris? Is that why you're able to be there? She's asking all of you, did you hear her question? No. Yes, and, and, and we can travel we can travel in Schengen countries. That's why I'm hopping from France to Italy at my leisure because there is no restriction between France and Italy or any other Schengen country. Right. But you were in France when this happened, right? I've been in France for thirty five years. <laughs> are you are all of you do you have French passports too, or you're able to do that with an American one no. because you live there? Legal, legal resident. Okay, thanks. Okay, so <laughs> I have French. I, I have French, American, and Italian. I, I would like to make a comment on this issue. Okay, if you have a visa to enter a port, you can basically enter France, and if your and your spouse enter France, even if they don't have a visa. Yeah. The boom is working. Feedback though, but okay. I did hear. I did hear. Sound okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you have to be legally. One of you. All right, I'm just going to talk because I can't hear very well. Um, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so if you don't know what I do, I write the Amy LeDuc investigation series set in the different arrondissements of Paris. And um, uh, Adrian has helped me. Lots of people have helped me doing research. And I get to go to Paris usually twice a year. And, but this is my first ever standalone, three hours in Paris. It's a historical thrill. And people have said, why, why, you know, what took you so long? <laughs> because it's like been 22 years of writing and I've always been writing a series because I really love to visit the different arrondissements of Paris. But for this story, which takes place in June 1940, which none of us were, none of us were in Paris at that time. Um, uh, it came because of 20, 22 years of going to Paris, researching, always hearing that little tidbit about the war, World War II, meeting my, you know, my friend's grandfather who had been in the resistance, meeting a woman who, had lived in Lyon, who also was in the resistance, and all, you know, none of these stories fit in my, oh, look, oh, that's great, I can see now. I can see my face, okay. <laughs> so none of these, you know, tidbits and pieces of information really fit in my Amy LeDuc stories, but I kept notebooks, and I have so many of those wonderful Claire Fontaine notebooks uh, filled with with tidbits of history, um, you know, right on your street, outside the window to Adrian's right, right is the mairie, right? The city hall of your arrondissement, which I think now is, is the main arrondissement of the four, uh, four districts, right? The four arrondissements, one through four. And is that right, Adrian? Has it changed over? Not yet. It hasn't changed yet, but the plan is for the districts one through four to um, be, you know, uh, combined. And mm -hmm. there's a lot to figure out. It's not that easy. I can imagine. So when you look at that Mary, which is gorgeous, there's Patty. <laughs> and when you, I, I was talking to you in Nîmes the other day, it feels like, but so when you look out at the Mary, to the right, right from where your cafe window will be, there's what kind of the rear of the Mary, I think it's an art center now or an exposition center. That was a place where they rounded up uh, Jewish people uh, in the part where there's part was a garage 
um, you, it's all changed now, it's been remodeled, but I've looked at the old photographs. So right outside your window was a roundup point uh, for Jewish people, 19, I believe it was 1942. So, I mean, there's just these places all over Paris. Um, and you were, you know, of course, you, those of you who live there and see it every day, you see the plaques on the wall. You see it outside the elementary schools, you know, you see it on the walls of buildings where people lived or where someone may have been shot during the liberation. You know, so those plaques and those memories are, you know, out there for the public to see. So anyway, um, I always wondered about that. And I'm a mystery writer. And it's always about the what if. And I look at something and say, what if, you know, which starts a writer spinning. And I'm sure there's a lot of writers in the group, everybody who I can't see, but I, you know, and there's always that, what if I was there? You know, what, what would I have done? And that really sparked me because I can't live in 1940, um, but I can imagine what it was like and I can think about it and I can wonder what would I have done? But you know what, I have no special skills and but what if someone who had a special skill, you know, was put there? And um, so that, that's really, that really drove me. And for, for me in this story, um, and I know Adrian and I talked about this earlier, it's like, how is my uh, female protagonist different from my usual protagonist, Amy Le Duc? And I wanted to write about an every woman, um, a woman, that certainly I could identify with because I have no superpowers. You know, I can't, I've shot guns, but I'm really not a crack shoot. I, you know, I, I can write a Vespa like Amy, but <laughs> I don't have her computer skills. Um, but what if my character in this standalone historical was an American gal who grew up during the depression uh, here in this, you know, in the thirties, like my mother had, and what if she uh, grew up in Oregon, had a hard scrabble life, you know, lived on ranches, uh, had five brothers, which would make any person resilient, right? Able to, uh, to deal with whatever life threw in her way. And what if she was a, a large boned person? And what if she was very different from the elegant, uh, anyway, I like to see her, you know, Amy the Duke. I see her as more elegant, she lives on this, 17th century apartment in the particulier on Ile Saint Louis, you know, and she's dressed as much better than I do and is chic and too sold in that effortless way. Unlike me, Kate from Oregon would definitely like me or, but she's also an every woman. She is the person who during wartime, you know, is called upon, you know, there are reserves in all of us. Maybe we do things we never thought or imagined we could do. She's a mother, she's a wife, she's a daughter, she's a sister. And I wanted to put her in, in trouble, in the crucible, in one of the, you know, most important parts of history, which was a footnote on a page. I believe it's really important because I think so much of the war, the war could have ended, the world, have been, world would have been different, but it didn't happen. So I'm sort of imagining an alternate possibility is that in Hitler's visit to Paris, his one and only visit, in for three hours. Three hours. Can you hear me? He came for three hours to pass. He left abruptly. Never returned to Paris. Is everything okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So why did he only come for three hours? Why did he never return? And why the man who had Paris before his feet, it was declared an open city, right? Because, uh, you know, they didn't want it to be bombed. They left. Why? Why, why didn't he have a victory parade down the Champs-Élysées, right? What if something happened? 
And I got that from this footnote in, in history about him coming for three hours to Paris. And I'm gonna hold up this picture and I know some of you have seen this before. Look at this. Can you see that? Can you see that? Hitler in the middle. Albert Speer on one side and Arno Brecker on the other. Okay. Arno Brecker was a well-known sculptor for the Fuhrer. Uh, Albert Speer was uh, the Fuhrer's architect and head of armaments. And, <laughs> hi. And, um, and they came with Hitler in his entourage, a very small entourage, to Paris for three hours. Now, you've seen the picture, both of these men, okay? After the war, okay, Speer after the war and they were imprisoned and down the road, both of the men wrote uh, memoirs and, you know, about their life and about, you know, and mentioned this visit with Hitler. Albert Speer um, said that this event, he came to Paris with Hitler on June 28th, I believe, or could be 27th. Arno Brecker wrote in his, uh, you know, recountings, it was June 23rd, which would make sense because they would have just come, Hitler would have just come from signing the armistice in Northern France. And no one ever challenged this in history. Most people accept June 23rd as the day that Hitler came, a Sunday. And I thought, well, what happened? Why are there two different versions? Both, I mean, you can watch them on YouTube. You can see them driving around here. Why, you know, why, why is this? Why, you know, historians to fact? And I thought, what if, and we all know now in this, in our world that this faux news is so prevalent. What if uh, Joseph Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, who sort of invented faux news, what if something happened to Hitler? Because in Paris, who knew it was recently, you know, people had left Paris. No one really knew, you know, Hitler was a conqueror. He was coming to his, uh, you know, France, to a city he'd never been to. What if people rebelled? Who knew, right? I mean, people do. What if someone, you know, took a shot at him? And what if that, that happened to be a woman, okay? Because I feel that women in World War II fiction get short shrift. Um, you, you know, we never read about women heroes in World War II. It's very rare. And I thought, well, a sniper, women are snipers. Americans did not have any, but there was a whole regiment or platoon, or I don't know the right word, a whole squadron in, in Russia who were female snipers who trained and made a difference at the Battle of Stalingrad. And what if, you know, and they were also a whole troop of female pilots as well. And what if we had an American female sniper? Uh, because in 1943, I believe the famous Russian sniper, Ludmila Pavlichenko, and I'm sorry, I'm massacring her name, had uh, 309 confirmed kills um, in Russia. She was invited to the United States um, and she was invited to the White House and met Eleanor Roosevelt and, and, you know, was taken around as, you know, talking about women who fought in war. And I was like, why don't we have, I don't, we need an American woman doing that. I mean, American women, British women, French women, Italian women, Polish women, Belgian women were also fighting the war, maybe not on the front lines, but they were nurses, they were um, telegraph operators. In the UK, they worked in the Code, Bletchley Park, um, you know, everywhere, but they were also on the home. Ambulance front. drivers, Kara, ambulance drivers too. Ambulance drivers, is that what you said? Sorry, ambulance mm -hmm. drivers, everything, everything, mm -hmm. right? And stoking the home fires and, you know, raising children and, you know, taking care of grandfathers and, you know, teaching school and everything, you know, but no one talks about that. 
um, and women have just been sort of left out of that part of it. So I really feel that that now at least there are books like um, All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna, and there's the Alice Network. Um, there's so many yeah, books, good. which I think is really interesting, and I love it. I don't know if it's because my generation, um, you know, or the you know, uh, the younger, you know, the newer generation, if they're all, you know, like reading their great grandmother's diaries or asking questions. And um, mm -hmm. I love that we're maybe a generation, well, of course, two generations, three generations away from this generation of women. But, but we're writing about it, aren't we? And I love that. And um, I just gobble those books up. I find there's a lot coming out of the UK. And um, I don't know if it's because, you know, they're like sitting down and great grandma, grandmamas, you know, uh, you know, diary is coming out of the attic when she's passed away or whatever, but it's, it's fantastic. Um, this generation of women who you know, worked like at Bletchley Park in the Code Center or, uh, you know, worked, you know, for the British government, like everyone else, they signed the Official Secrets Act, which means you went, right? You could not talk about that, pain of death, everything else. This was wartime. Okay, the stakes were high. This is war. This is a different situation. And of course, everywhere were signs, loose lips sink ships, right? I mean, you had to be careful everywhere you went, someone could have overheard you, um, but that's the way it was. And of course, this generation, unlike ours, would never have taken a selfie. <laughs> Okay, Instagram would have been a no-no, okay? Not their way. And of course they didn't have, you know, what we have now. But, but of course, what they were doing and working with were very cutting edge for the time. I really wanted, um, you know, Kate in the story has a special, specially fitted Lee Enfield a rifle for a sniper. I really wanted to put a silencer on it. Okay, when I first, my first draft, I had a silencer, you know, and I had all this and I'm like, you know that, that? and I talked to some gun experts and I'm like, you know, given her scenario, given her a few seconds that no, she would not have a, a silencer. It's not like you can put it on now that looks like a cigar. It was like several drafts before I finally had to take the cigar snipe, uh, suppressor off and not use it. Um, but they were coming up with materials. Right now I'm working on something and I'm, I'm realizing that um, when I was doing the research about, about this, that there was a lipstick gun, okay? Adrian, lipstick gun, okay? You would have loved it because it existed, seriously. And I couldn't use it in the story. Kate wouldn't have a lipstick gun, okay? Unfortunately, but I think in the next version, use the lipstick gun. Okay, is that cool or what? Um, and these really work. Does it work as lipstick and a gun? <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Totally practical. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> All of these things that they designed, um, you know, in these works. Actually, there was a there were workshops behind the Victoria and Albert Museum that they took over and uh, they used people from the movie industry and they, they did all the clothing for, and they were all scattered all over London, but the coolest one was behind the Victoria and Albert and they were making, you know, like French clothes for agents, they dropped behind the lines. You know, of course there would be, you know, a special, and everything they designed also had to be practically applicable. I mean, if she pulls out her, her lipstick, she has to be able to apply it and then, I don't know, shoot, but do you know what I mean? And they were always coming up with these things. And actually the M who's in James Bond films, right? There was an M who designed all these things. Um, what was great about my research, which I did several years ago, was visiting the Churchill War Rooms underground London, which maybe some of you have gone to or you, next time you go to London, you've got to go there. It's just this little sign, and you just go down, and it's left from the war. You know, there are the rooms where they have the maps, and they're plotting, you know, troop movements. 
it has the old um, melamine telephones. And there are, the, there are the typewriters and they have padded, uh, sort of padded keyboard, not a, not a, of course not a computer, because Churchill didn't like the clacking you know, typewriters. So the secretaries had to, had to mute that sound. It's amazing. So I got to set, you know, set several scenes there and it was, it's really tiny, you know, when you're going through these kind of war and of underground areas. And I thought, can you imagine what it was like during war and during the Blitz and all this was going on and this was the, the center of kind of the British uh, arena of war. So um, I got to use all that in the story. And I, I wanted to put an American woman who is not uh, fashionable or, you know, uh, you know, really savvy or European in trouble. And uh, she has lost her, well, I can't, I don't know how much I can say because I don't want to make spoilers. So for many reasons, she, um, she takes this mission, which is like a suicide mission, to shoot Hitler in Paris in the three hours he was there. Um, so, and once I found, found that footnote, I was just, I had to write this story. It took me, oh, I've been sort of writing this book on and off for 10 years, but it was three years ago when that tidbit came out and then I just knew, you know, when I write, sometimes I start writing and I don't know where I'm going, but I knew where I was going here. I had my character. I had, I had the time, I had the minutes. And, you know, we, we have a deadline here of 36 hours. I also wrote a German character who is, could be Kate's nemesis, who is a, who was a homicide investigator in Munich before the war. He's drafted to work in the Fuhrer's security detail because there were many, many, many attempts on, on Hitler's life. Who knew that this man had more lives than several cats put together? But it really, really happened. And I wanted to have a German character who was not a, who was not a cliched Nazi, who had depth and texture and some complexity. Because we all know that there are sometimes good people who have to do bad things. And sometimes bad people who can do good things. You know, it's gray, it's not black and white. And so I really wanted to have a character who loved his family, who was a product of Weimar Germany, who may not have liked his job, but you know, he had a boss, the Fuhrer. <laughs> so he, his, life was, his life and his family's life was in danger if he didn't deliver as well. So um, do you have any comments or questions so far? I have a question. Is your vision that this becomes a series or is your vision that this is always just a standalone book? What a good question. That's what my editor was asking me. <laughs> and um, no, it's great. Um, I originally just wrote it because I had to write this story. And, um, but you know, it's amazing that book has gone into three printing so far in the pandemic. I mean, I had no idea. I thought, you know, this book came out in April, but uh, people are reading, there you go. And, um, and so I don't know, they're asking me if I want to write another one too. And I'm like, well, if I find a story, you know, that keep, and if I find something that uh, you know works, and sort of I'm sort of working on that right now. But thank you. I, I'm not giving a definitive answer, but I think so. And I've also turned in my next Amy Leduc book, which will come out in 2021. What part of Paris will that be? But now you have to guess. There's only two I haven't written about. Okay. Okay. Well, it's the 15th arrondissement. So just bordering the 7th. Do any of you live in the 15th? I did at one point, but I don't anymore. <laughs> really? Did you like it? Oh, yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was a, near a little square, Square Lambert, 
and near the Rue de Beaujolais. It was lovely. I thought maybe you'd run out of arrondissement, which is why you didn't write this one as an M.A. Le Duc, and you wrote a standalone. <laughs> no, I've, I've got that in the 19th. The 19th is left. Um, but actually, the tentative title is Murder at Vaugirard, so... Oh, okay. That's where I live. <laughs> yeah. Vaugirard, Rue de Vaugirard is the longest street in Paris, yeah. but... Yeah. And it's hard to kind of encapsulate the 15th, which is a huge arrondissement. It has so many okay. different districts. Right. Cara, do you know the 20th of Paris? Say that again? Do you know the 21st district of Paris? Okay, I live in San Francisco, and we used to call the area down, um, uh, what is it, down uh, Polk Street, we used to call that the 21st arrondissement of Paris. But I don't think that's the one you're talking about. <laughs> no, the, 20, the, the 21st in Paris is considered to be Deauville. Deauville? Yes. Wow, why? Because that's where we all go on the weekend when we're in Paris. Everybody goes to Deauville. Okay. <laughs> you never heard of that. It's been like that for oof, years and years and years and years, ever since I've been here. <laughs> My friends don't go to Deauville, but, you know, I guess everybody's different. Okay. Why was it they said that they go? I didn't hear the answer to why they go, why it's called Deauville. Deauville's on the coast. It's also, there's a big casino, but a it, lot of it's people. It's the closest beach to. It's in the film from uh, Gigi as well. They go to Deauville. Everybody goes to Deauville because, and it's very, very well known for the racetrack, you know, the, the, the um, horse races. You've got the American. It's well known as well for the American Film Festival every year. It's just the last day of last year. No, it's going on the street. It's probably for men. Like, play ends on Friday. Uh -huh. The wonderful film, and then we need to Maybe if everyone muted themselves, is that okay? Can you hear me? Oh, what am I? I just finished Ellie Griffiths, a British writer who has a uh, uh, what is it? Uh, a forensic anthropologist who helps discover, you know, who helps the police with crime. Um, and, uh, yeah, I uh, has written this, which you should get because uh, I've gone here with him and I use some of these places in the story. Um, you know him, don't you, Adrian Gil Thomas? Do you know Adrian? You know him. He should come and talk at Opry Midi. He's a, he's I'm sorry, who are, you, who are you asking about? Gilles Thomas. Gilles Thomas. No. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, I, I, I have to mute my computer because it creates a reverberation. It's wild what's going on in here. <laughs> Gilles Thomas, yeah. Yeah, here it is. You can find this book. Now, I don't remember, is, is Penelope there or did Penelope come? Yes, I, Penelope's here with books. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. There she is. Hi, Pen. <laughs> Hi, Pen. <laughs> I love your mask. Oh my God, how are you? Look at the sun coming up out my window. Do you see? Do you see the fog? Fog and the smog. Oh, well, <laughs> I hope you all go to Penelope's bookstore, which moved from the Marais, many of you know, 
and it's right across from the Jardin du Luxembourg, next to, uh, two doors down from Tres Bakery, uh, just wonderful. And um, she is your Canadian bookseller in Paris. And if she's got the book and I'm happy, I will send her book plates, signed book plates. That look at that, look at all those books she has. I will send you book plates if you let me know, or I'll send a bunch of signed book plates to Penelope. So- um, She won't go home with them, Karen. She won't go home with them. Okay, if you get this book there, I will send book plates to Penelope and, and I will, you know, just write your name down. Tell me your, Adrienne will tell me your name and I'll personally address a book plate to you. If we're in the United States, how can we get a signed book from you? Um, then you've got to go through, do you know, um, I, you could do my local bookstore in San Francisco, Folio Books. F-O-L-I-O, -O. they're down, they're three blocks from me and I can go down and sign a book there. Or Book Passage in Cor de Madera, California. I, I think I've gone and signed some stock. I live near the Atlantic Ocean, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Poison Pen Bookstore in, in Scottsdale, Arizona? They do mail order and um, and they would and I signed a bunch of books for them too. Carol, when you finish all the arrondissements, where will Amy go? When I finish all the arrondissements, I don't know. I have no idea, um, and I don't know. You know, Chloe, her daughter is getting older, so um, I think Chloe will have a role. Maybe something will happen at the preschool. I really don't. No. Remember, she's only, in the next book, Chloe will be three years old. Okay, three. So she's still tiny. So um, we'll see. I don't know. I really don't know. And um, I think that I'm so glad that I wrote these books and I set them in the 1990s when I started writing them. And now we're, we're moving ahead slowly. Because look at, you know, this arrondissement where you are right now, it's going to be gobbled up, you know, it'll all be one arrondissement, which feels so odd to me, you know, because there is a character, right, in each arrondissement. Well, I mean, in each district that composes an arrondissement. Um, I, I just want to say one thing when I was doing research in, um, you know, uh, I was actually downstairs of your cafe across the street at Cafe Sancerre. <laughs> is that, is that, am I allowed to say that, Adrian? You know, Cafe Sancerre across the street. Um, I was there meeting my friend, who Jean Nabu, who lives across uh, the park. And um, I was talking to him and he was telling me, maybe this was three years ago, he was saying, you know, Cara, do you know about the butcher's slang? And I was going, no, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, uh, during the war and for, you know, since the turn of the century, like 1900, um, the butchers of Paris, of France, have an argo, you know, which is their little slang that they talk with each other. And by that, I mean a kind of uh, inversion of the words, kind of like, what is it, Esperanto or Pig Latin? You know how you turn the words? No, verlon. It's called verlon. Caroline, where they turn the syllables? Yeah. No. Um, is specific to the butchers who came up with their own. And that is because they were cheating customers or, you know, making deals or whatever, you know, and maybe many, many, um, many trades Cara have that. So they had Lushabem, the butcher's slang. It's called Lushabem. Exactly. That's what he told me about. And I went, really? And he said, yeah, and they used that during the war. You know, uh, they used that, whether they were active resistance, they weren't out there shooting guns, but you know, the war lasted from 1940 to 44, and there were all different kinds of acts of resistance. And you know, maybe they used this language when they were, you know, 
uh, you know, hiding someone, helping someone, you know, on the way down to Spain, whether they, you know, there's different ways people resisted and didn't give up their life or their family, you know, continue their regular role. So I got to use that. I thought that's fantastic. You know, these are patriots in their own way. And of course, I put them up in the 19th off the canal at La Villette, because at that time, it was an active abattoir, you know. And they were also working in Leal, you know, the famous food market. They were all there. Right. So, you know, this was, th remember, there, was, there wasn't refrigeration in those days, you know, like we know it now. They used ice, right, ice boxes. So people or restaurants or, you know, little shops would go and go to the butchers up at the abattoir, you know, and buy sides of beef or whatever. And you see those, especially in Leal, the, the famous, you know, with men with their carrying these hunks of pig, you know, and stained aprons. But, you know, especially they would bring in, in La Villette, you know, they had all the rail tracks. Um, and my friend's cousin lived on the street and I got to use that because there's old rail tracks that would lead from the trains bringing in the cattle, the sheep, the cows, whatever, and bring them into the abattoir from the countryside and then slaughter them and people would pick them up. Also down in the, working on the, the next day May in Parc Georges Brassin, that also was a big abattoir, which is now the, the old, uh, you know, the, um, the open air market, which is now for old books. They left part of that, that used to be the abattoir. And then they have the rail lines Le Petit Centure, which is the ring road around Paris, they would bring their animals, right, from the countryside, and then bring them down through Parc Brasso to the abattoir. So, you know, in those days, it was, it was more about fresh food, right? It was fresh uh, everything. And that's why people went to the market every day, because they didn't have, you know, refrigeration, or they wanted something fresh. Anyway, I just, I just, Zooming, I would be I'm right zooming. there. We're zooming. So you would have been up, what, at six or seven? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I got up at 5 a.m. to get ready, put some, put something on my face, and, you know, as, as maybe you, too, in this You're coast. Right. So um, that's okay. Yeah, well, I was yeah. up at 5.30. What do you, don't you have um, residency? Can't you go back to Paris? I, I do. I have a talent, a visa talent competent, which actually expires in uh, coming no this coming November. So I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do there. I understand they've been extended. Um, but actually, you know, you have to have, those of you who've asked, I've just very recently tried to make an escape to Paris, um, back to Paris. You have to have, as I understand it, a COVID that is uh, pot that's negative 72 hours before you arrive in in you're Canada. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's yes, exactly yeah. that. 72 well, hours, they will not let you board the plane and you can be retested again once you get to CDG airport. They have set up tents and people can be tested again. So this is what I understand. Um, and there's far fewer flights. Um, I tried to send some certified mail because this gym keeps charging me 50 euros a month and I haven't been there. Um, and, they, and the post office here told me that the mail to Paris is very, very slow because there's far fewer flights going. Right. And yes, was, yes and no, because I recently sent a package and it got to Washington in six days. No, I'm talking so, about from the US to, to Yeah, Paris. I'm talking about Paris to Washington and Washington wow. to Paris. It's starting well, to the come West back Coast. Off. They were saying it could take a couple of weeks. I mean, there was no guarantees even was certified. Uh, so things are not the way that they used to be. Uh, it's interesting knowing about that. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, you ha can, can I interject something here? Boom off. Can you take the boom off?
I would like to bring the conversation back to your book and what you're doing and not about how to get into France, if you don't mind. <laughs> Just to get back on track. Of course, thank you. And this is, this is from uh, you, who, this is from Adrian who urging me to go to Croatia a few months ago with me back into wait, France. Wait. But, I want everyone to come into France, okay? However, <laughs> if we open this conversation, we will be here for hours in circles around this, so. Right, well, well, we'll all be on planes when we can get on them. I think that's, that's just the way it is, but. Um, okay, back, yeah. back to the book and to you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think World War II, what happened, um, is, is there's just so many, so much more to mine because it was, it was the sort of the good war, right? I mean, you know, but I also noticed, and I think what's always intrigued me because as an American growing up in America, um, my country was not occupied, but my grandfather, my uncle, uh, my mother's cousins were all in the, in the service and served. My um, mother's cousin, we always call him our cousin too, he was um, uh, from Chicago and he was stationed in the UK with the uh, Air Force or you know, RAF or whatever they, they work together. And he was in, uh, his group was a bomber. Um, and it's, you see it in the movies, right? Those old big giant planes with the, with the plexiglass bombing not module at the end of it where they hit the bomb hatch and his group went to Italy and they were always bombing Italy those that was their location <laughs> and um, so he and I learned all this much later when I got older but I always kind of wondered about my cousin my mother's cousin who was a wonderful guy uh, who was one you know I loved him but there were always times when he would be very sad, you know, as, as a young child. Um, later we learned he was bipolar and all that. But what, what I learned later was that he was supposed to go on a bombing mission with his group. And uh, he woke up in the morning and he was really, really sick and he could not go, he could not perform. So they went ahead. They never came back. So he had this huge guilt survivor's guilt, you know, he should have gone, he should have, you know, not the others. And so, um, and that never left him. I'm not saying, you know, he, he lived to, you know, for a long time after that. But I think there were those people, I don't know if some of you have your fathers, your grandfathers, your great grandfathers, you know, fought in the war, went to Europe, or in the, you know, East, uh, you know, in Japan, or, and if, you know, if they ever talked about it. You know, I have a lot of people who say they just won't talk about it, you know? My yeah. mother experienced World War II. <clears throat> she experienced the Americans bombing Genoa. Her father was a general in the army, so they had firsthand news. And um, I heard stories all the time about World War II from my mother. And, and she came from a noble family, so they had money. And during World War II, they lost a lot. They sold jewelry to survive. Uh, my husband's family is French, so there were a lot of people who were in the resistance. So I can tell you stories about the resistance, you know, galore. So my question to you is, Cara, how many people did you interview that were in the resistance, the children of whose parents were in the resistance, so their grandparents? How many, where did you interview people all over France to get an idea of what the resistance was all about in France or just locally? Good question, um, and we should talk sometime. I'm in Paris, let's go for coffee. Um, but what, I mean, it's hard, I can't pin anything down. I've been working on this book for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And over the period of time, people have told me things. So there were, it, it's not like one thing, but there were stories that I picked out because every time I would be in Paris, I would learn something. It's, and many of these things found their way into my Amy Leduc books. There's always, you know, if you notice, there's always someone there who's, you know, there's a reference to World War II or what happened. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I think Murder in the Marais, which deals with, uh, you know, which is set right near you, right? I mean, right near, you know, in the fourth arrondissement is 
about, um, it based on the story of my friend's mother who was a hidden Jewish child in the Marais. And of course I can fictionalize that, but there were a lot of things I learned from that. So I think, but if there's one thing about a female resistant that really helped me writing this story was a woman who, Anna, she's in her night, well, she's passed away now. Uh, she was from Lyon and uh, she was, uh, you know, she got a medal. And when I met her, we went out for coffee um, and where she lived and she was so gorgeous. I mean, she had all her teeth, her hair was, her skin was magnificent. She was in her nineties and you know, I just thought, wow. And she was saying, you know, I grew up in Lyon. You know, my father was a printer, had a printing business. And it was, I don't know, I was married. My husband, you know, had gone off to, you know, whether he was a POW, I think. We had a toddler. Um, I had to help my father. I had to, you know, take care of my grandfather. I had to take care of my husband's mother, you know, and my child. But, you know, I would also, but I would, you know, Sometimes my father, I would have a, a, a child minder, someone to watch the toddler. And this day I didn't. So I bicycled with my baby on my back down to my father just to, and he said, I need you to make this delivery. So just imagine this woman with a toddler on her back or, and a basket. And her father said, I need you to, to deliver this, right? Printing, whatever. And, uh, but it was very heavy what he gave her. So she put it in the basket along with her eggs <laughs> from the market and started riding uh, to outside Lyon. And of course she was stopped by German patrol, a checkpoint. And they're like, okay, okay, go on. You know, here's a woman with a baby on her back and eggs and, you know, been to market. She keeps going, she rides and goes to wherever the meeting point was takes off her eggs and hands the package to, you know, one of the maquis, right? The, the resistance guys in the, in the countryside. And of course, it's a bunch of guns, you know? And when she told me that, I went, what? You had your baby with you, you were, she said, yeah, of course, you know, I didn't know, but my father asked me to do it and I did it. I didn't ask questions, um, you know, it's what you did. And she said, and who's gonna, who cares? I mean, who's going to, you know, question me, right? And I love that story because that's like the every woman, you know, and who else was there around? There were no young men. There were, you know, they were either, you know, prisoners of war in, in you know, in STO, STO, service to life, obligatory, obligatory as war service in Germany or in hiding, you know, uh, it was women who, just had to do the job. I mean, if there was a man who was 25 walking around the streets of Paris, he was either a gangster, a black marketeer, he was a collaborator, right? I mean, you know, they just weren't around. So women did these jobs and why not? So, but there's, like you say, there's just so many stories of those. And these people are, whether, you know, they've left us or they're leaving us, my, um, I call him my boyfriend, Naftali, he's 91. He lives just down from you on Rue Volta. And uh, he was 14 years old during the war and he hid outside, his mother put him outside Paris and he came in at liberation and uh, was helping. And his mother ran one of the, um, she got a house from and paid for by the Jewish community group where um, people, young people who survived the camps came back and, or the orphans from the war. And one of them was Elie Wiesel. And uh, so Tali is always telling me stories. When I come, he drives, he still drives. He probably shouldn't, but anyway, he does. And, um, and we drive around Paris and we drive at night. And he tells me, this is where I was. You know, he used to, you know, where he used to hide. This is where my first wife lived. This is where this happened. And we'll drive around at night because he doesn't walk very well. And I'll see different parts of Paris. And he'll be telling me these stories. Um, in Place Sainte Catherine, which is down further in the Marais, he said, uh, he, he calls himself a Titi, you know, un vrai Parisien Titi. Um, and he was just a, a kid on the streets and it was a real ghetto around that area now. It's so fancy, right? Place Sainte Catherine, it was gorgeous. But we went around and he went, 
We used to, you know, come here after school and it was all where the puta, you know, the prostitutes would be on each corner, you know. And here was, this was a hotel de passe, it's now a coiffure, you know. And this was the, uh, I forget the name when they called it, where a man would take a mistress, you know, and pay for the apartment, you know, and just visit her and he paid for it. This was, you know, and he was talking about all the different kinds of, of ladies who were working and they would always give him and all the other children, you know, bonbon because they were kids. And he said they were always nice to us. He was standing on the Rue Saint Antoine when the Germans marched into Paris in 1940. They came, I guess, from the north, I don't know, down from Bastille. And he was standing there and he said the Germans were instructed to be polite. They went to the different, uh, you know, fruit, uh, you know, people who had carts, the, the marchand de saison, marchand de quatre saisons, like fruit, fruit carts. And this German bought a bunch of bananas and he started handing out the bananas to all the children and one to Titali. He said that was the first time I ever ate a banana was a German troop came in. And of course his father was um, taken and he was beheaded at the concentration camp Struthof Nazweiler. So they're uh, just amazing stories, you know, as you I, know. I, I, could, I could share plenty from my husband's family with you. His grandfather was a TB doctor and hid uh, Jewish people in his sanatorium um, outside Lyon. Um, so there are plenty of stories. And I have many friends whose grandparents also have had stories because they're no longer living today. But um, it was a very fascinating period. And when you have the stories firsthand, you can't imagine what these people went through. Mm. My, my father as an American uh, attended the Nuremberg trials. Wow. I hope, I hope you and all, all the people you know are writing it down or, or recording them, you know, before. I have um, my mother's story written and I'm writing something about it. Um, I just have to get authorization from my family because I think there's a story to be told. So she, she was Italian and she lived, you know, World War II firsthand, so. Right. But, you know, I, I think, too, I mean, there are these stories, but they, they speak to us about now, you know, resistance, um, you know, and making do with what you have. Um, in, in the story, Kate has learned in her brief period, at, you know, when she was taught some espionage tricks, RADA, R-A-D-A, which is read the situation. It stands for that. A assess the outcomes. D, decide what you're going to do, your course of action. And A, act on it. And I found when, when I first, you know, when COVID first happened, and of course I'm still doing it now, I'm rada every situation. Like, okay, is it important that I go out to the store? Is it important that I go to the post office? You know, is it, you know, what am I doing? What are my chances? You know, how about this? How about that? Um, you know, and then do I do it? And I found myself very much always reading the situation, trying to evaluate and decide and doing it. And I think so much of, of COVID, at least where we are, it's very much about that and, um, and how everything we do affects everyone else, you know. Right. Would you read from your book? People are chatting and saying they'd love to have you read something from your book. Could you Thank do that you for us? That, Mary. And also, uh, Kara, we have a couple of questions from the people in the room here. Sure. So before we, we would love for you to read something from the book, but before you do that, can I uh, open up the forum? Sure. <laughs> okay, but you're going to come up oh. here. Well, just so she can. No, sorry. This is this is really technically challenging, but it's but it's okay. So here, take the spot. Oh, okay. Hi, Kara. Hi. I really enjoyed the presentation. Just want to know who's going to play the main character in the Hollywood movie. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> Who do you think? I have no idea. Oh, she'd have to be a big bone gal. Someone said, oh, Charlene, Charlize Theron? No, no. 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 Real life. Exactly. Kate Winslet? I don't know. Yes. Uh, can you hear what's going on here? Can, can you hear or see what's going on here? I can see, but I can't hear. You can't hear it? I can hear you, but I can't hear background. Is there anyone else who'd like to come ask her question from here? No? No one else in the room? Okay, what can I say? You've got, you've got, I don't know, a hundred. I, I have a question. Ah, come on, Penelope. Penelope has a question. Just a second. Take the spot. Nice. Uh, hi. My question is, when it began, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but did you know how it was going to end? And was there any moment when you were scared yourself? Yes, yes. I... I didn't know how it was. I had another ending, actually. You know, I had a very different ending. And I can't reveal it, unless you've all read the book and then we could, you know, talk about it. Um, I, I had a different ending, which I changed. And were there points that I was scared? Yes. When I had Kate uh, rounded up and arrested and manacled, uh, you know, in a prison, in a... Uh, I didn't know how she was going to get out, you know, because I had to, you know, when, when you're writing a scene like that, you really need to <laughs> tie your hands behind your back. You need to, you know, put yourself in a chair and physically try out what it's like. How are you going to describe what is it like to get out with your arms behind your back, you know? And I was like, I have to come out. I have to figure out a way that she could actually escape and how she could do what she needs to do. And so that was, you know, kind of like a challenge. Could she, could, could someone do that? So um, I think what Kate has learned in her life, you know, growing up on a ranch where you have cattle, where you have, you know, cow hands that need to be fed, where you have chores that you need to do. I mean, people, you work on a farm, on a ranch, and of course, I know people who probably have done that, you don't have the luxury of, you know, not feeling well and not wanting to, you know, give the cows their meat, their food. You know, you have to be able to get out there in a snowstorm. You've got to mend a fence so that the cattle don't escape. You've got to see that there, and during this time I did research when I was up in Oregon, there were wolves, you know, and there was a bounty on wolves in Southern Oregon and Northern California and there was $25 bounty, which was a lot of money in those days during the Depression, which Kate's father, you know, would do. And Kate had to be able to defend the ranch with a gun, which he had learned to use to um, defend it from, you know, animals, to find, to shoot game, to eat. So, um, um, yeah, so that kind of I felt that she using a gun for her was a tool. It was nothing scary. It was nothing unusual. Um, but putting herself in a sort of situation where she needs to be someone else uh, to pretend. Um, and I was just thinking about that this morning. If you're, if you're undercover, okay, if you're playing, a, you know, if you're acting another role in a, in a certain situation, you can't be self-conscious about what you're doing. And, and I was doing a lot of research on spies. The, the best spy there is, is the one you never notice. You just don't notice. Because they look like everyone else. They blend, they fit in, they don't stand out. They are not James Bond, okay? No, no James Bond. You don't wanna have that Aston Martin at the curb. No way, because you want no one to notice you. Your job is to get in there, to perform your mission, get out, right? If you want to survive and do what you need to do, either unnoticed or discovered after you've, you know, left, closed the door. And that's what's really important. So how is Kate, who's a large gal, who's very American, 
who, you know, who, how is this gal going to blend in in Paris? I mean, right? She's going to stick out. What can you do with that? So I really, really love that. I read lots of books about espionage. Um, there's a woman who was head of um, the CIA's, um, you know, whatever, cam uh, disguises unit. And you can find her on YouTube. And she does this great thing about how you can even make a man look like a woman, how you can, you can change everything else. Um, and what it is, and it's the small things. It's the pebble in the shoe that makes you walk differently. It's the stuff that's patted in your cheeks, like Marlon Brando did for The Godfather. Remember how he talked funny and everything? It's the, it's the little pieces of charcoal that you line your face that makes you look older. And as many of us have learned, older women, no one notices you, right? We're invisible. So, so you know, always play that invisible card, the older woman, you know, uh, wearing a, you know, a, a smock, like a cleaner. You know, who notices cleaners? So there's all these different ways. So I had someone who was like a, a square peg for a round hole. And I really loved playing with that because if you do, and, and, and I guess what I want to say, she had to believe it, right? If you're walking into a courtyard as she does at the uh, opposite the Hotel Crillon in Place de la Concorde, the Maritime Ministry, which I went to many times inside, downstairs, in the bowels up, uh, which is now being remodeled. How would you walk in there? And I did that. How am I going to walk in there as an American and get past the French guards? Well, then it would have been, you know, German. How would you do that? What would you do? How would you look? How would you be? First of all, you have to believe you are the nurse. You are the cleaner. You are the, you've got to be that, you know, it's not pretending. It's, a, it's taking that role and it, and it, you know, and you've got to make it. You know, I mean, I think we've all done that in life, right? Sometimes you get somewhere and you act, you know, you, you need to be another, assume another persona or, or something. Um, and, and we all find that in ourselves to do that. But Kate's got to do that all the time. Always be aware. Um, and I think being an undercover spy would be incredibly taxing and and, and physically, you'd be exhausted, you know, just the mental, mentally being on top, always looking, reading the situation, whatever. And then, you know, being that person, not assuming that role, really being it, you know, which was great. You know, um, I loved writing a thriller with pace. You know, there's 30, the Fuhrer gives Gunter 36 hours to find the sniper. And that's it. Talk, right? The clock is turning, you know. She's got a lot on the line. He has a lot on the line. Back in Britain, Stepney, Kate's handler, has a lot on the line. Do you want me to read that part? I just happen to have this handy. <laughs> um, and by the way, you can see Penelope will show, Penelope will show you. I have this amazing map that they designed and I went everywhere that Kate goes on the bus, in the metro, walking on a bike. It's all there and it shows you the abattoir. Where is the abattoir? Up here. And also the clavery, which is the corset shop. It's still there. You can see it. It's great. They don't sell corsets anymore, but it's up there. It's, you can see it from the bus. And I knew when I passed it on the bus, I just knew I had to put that in the story. So I'm just going to read uh, page 62 randomly. So it's just, I'll read a few paragraphs. Sunday, June 23rd, 1940 near Place de Clichy, 9.15 a.m. Kate held her breath, expecting to be shot on the spot, but the Wehrmacht soldier set Kate's bag in her basket, doffing his cap. Bonjour, mademoiselle, he said with a wide grin, gesturing for her to pass. Allez-y. 
her fingers trembling on the handlebars. She gave him a thin smile and pedaled ahead, turning the corner and not looking back. She made herself take deep breaths. Clouded by emotion, she hadn't stayed alert. She hadn't been on the streets of Paris 10 minutes and she'd almost run down a German soldier. She'd practically handled the rifle to the enemy, which was in her basket, revealing herself as a foreign spy. She would have faced interrogation, then the firing squad, idiot. Sweat trickled down her back. She had papers, an identity card, but would they have held up? She'd gotten so lucky. That wouldn't happen a second time. Life didn't work like that. Buck up, girl, her father would say. Concentrate. Stick to the plan. She pedaled by the Gomo movie palace, now bearing a banner that read Soldat in Kino, and the soldiers lining up for an early movie. Continued toward the square de Batignol down a cobbled side street where a man fed rabbits in a hutch outside a cafe. Beyond that lay a street market. On the steps of Saint-Marie de Batignol, a black-robed priest was welcoming parishioners. She could have sworn he nodded to her. She set her bike against the wall by the bakery, went inside, waited in line, and asked for Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie's at church, said the curly-haired woman clad in an apron. She gazed levelly at Kate. Like always, mademoiselle, the woman held out a receipt and coin. You forgot your change this morning. Kate palmed it without a glance at what she'd received. Merci beaucoup, madame. The meat was on. This handoff would indicate the next location to go to. Now that Gomo movie palace uh, at that time is now the art darty, darty store. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think you used to talk about going to that Darty store, Adrian, when you had to buy, I don't know, electrical goods. But, um, you know, it's just, I, you know, now they have a few um, uh, cinemas next to it. But um, I remember going to Batigno. Uh, I also use that in, uh, in one of my murder in Clichy. I also have a murder right there across from the church. But of course, now we're in 1940. And I went there on a Sunday and there was the priest talking to all his flock on the steps. And it was just wonderful because it was timeless, right? But it was like in 1940 and now, you know, Sunday after church, people on the steps going to the bakery, this and that. So there's so many things that you write about that, that, are, that are familiar today. There's a scene in the Jardin de Luxembourg, you know, uh, right near Penelope's, you know, uh, Red Wheelbarrow store. I, w I would go visit Penelope and then I would walk past Tres Bakery, up past the Senate, and sit down at the, at the Medici, Marie de Medici Fountain, which is wonderful right there, and there's all the benches there. Over the years, I've sat there, I don't know how many times, you know, winter, summer, spring, fall, um, you know, hearing the children play, they're pushing those boats, um, all these things, you know, the sun is dappling my legs, there, there's the autumn leaves falling, I'm, and, and then, I sat there and I was like, so this is where Gunther would sit. Gunther, the German who's searching for the assassin. Gunther would have sat here to, to meet a contact. He would have sat on this bench because it was there. He would have felt the sun on his shoulders. He would have heard the fountain. He would have seen the children because it's timeless, you know. So there's these wonderful things that fit in a story, you know, that, that I could use. Do you want to see the red sun? You see that? You see the red sun? Oh. Yes, oh. It's, it's from all your fires, isn't it? They're all around. Terrible. Look at. No. Yeah. Air quality is so bad. That's what I've heard. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. That was really wonderful to hear you read the passage. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I've never read that before, but I just wanted to, you know, because I feel in a way this story is very current, 
given mm. given what's going on in the world, phone news and and many things, uh, we just always have to be careful. We have to watch. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to talk to people today who are in their 90s, given the world situation today and how they compare it, how they would compare it to the 1940s. My father is 93. He's living alone, independent, and we have talked about it. And he said to me, there is one word that I would use to describe the world situation today to Europeans. And I said, what dad? And he said to me, he said it to me um, in French. Uh, he said it to me in Italian and I will say it to you in English. And he said, slaughterhouse. So he thinks the situation today is so much more worrying or preoccupying than World War II. He was born under Calvin Coolidge, so you can imagine how many presidents he has seen. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, there's one thing I forgot to say, just talking about, you know, females and, and different generations, um, that there was a British woman who, I think this was in 2010, I read this article, an old British woman died in Bristol uh, in a little house uh, when they found her, it can't have been pretty because she'd been there a few days, but she had no friends, she had no family, no one knew anything about her. She was always pleasant and nice, but really no one really knew her. Um, and so they, uh, you know, everyone felt terrible that this woman had laid dead in her house. And, and so when they were going through, they thought, oh, she must be, you know, they couldn't find any money or anything. And they thought, oh, she's a widow, you know, on a pension. You know, and so they were going to bury her in a pauper's grave, you know, this old, you know, woman in Bristol, until somehow they're going through the apartment or the house and they're, they finally found something. They found a Légion d'honneur medal, this older British woman. And then they found other things and whatever. And she had been in the, she was British. Uh, she, I don't know if she had a French mother or whatever, but she uh, worked in the SOE, Special Operations Executive, and was an agent sent to France, undercover, was captured, sent to Ravensbrück, which was the female uh, concentration camp, survived, uh, came back and lived very quietly uh, the rest of her life, um, and no one knew anything about this. She just died alone. And everyone, of course, when they found out, they buried her and gave her a grave, but it's like it was too late. But it's like these, this generation, these women, they, find, they signed the Official Secrets Act, and that was it, right? They took it literally to the grave. This generation didn't, you know, I mean, of course, in your family, people talk. But many people um, even didn't talk to their family. I mean, you know, they just don't because that's not what you did. It's very different from us. And I think, you know, there's a certain honor to that and a different, different kind of value uh, that we don't all share today, you know, which really, really struck me. You know, it could be anyone. And often in France, when I'm walking around Paris and I see someone who's very small, you know, and I just mean like an older person who may be just hitting five feet. Um, and I realized they grew up during the war. whole generation who are smaller because they were their growth was stunted you know I mean you see that Adrian I mean there's anywhere 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 in Paris right people who are smaller who did not have all the calories you know because there was a minimum so those people you know uh, you know you just know uh, which is really strange because in Holland they have like they nowadays they have the tallest people in the world you know, the height stature. And then you see these guys and you're like, wow, these Dutch guys in the airport, these are huge. And then you see their grandmothers and they're like four feet tall. <laughs> so it's really, you know, what, what a difference nutrition makes too, you know, after the war. I mean, they must have a lot of dairy up there. I don't know. These really Dutch guys are huge. I, I couldn't believe it. He was next to his grandmother. He could have been four little grandmothers up to his height, you know. It was kind of amazing. 
Um, but yeah, I think the area, they, you know, and it's fascinating to hear these stories because it felt more like there was, you know, good and evil, you know. Right? I have a 95 year old French friend. I can't see the rest of it. I'm sorry, I can't see your comments either. The comments just kind of come up and disappear. Do you want to read them to me, Adrian? Or I'm sorry, I turn the boom turn off. The boom. Oh no! <laughs> I'm back. We're back. <laughs> um, you, if you open your chat which for some reason I don't even have mine. Oh, I can, oh, I can see a little bit of it. I can see a little bit here. I have a 95 year old French friend who tells me stories of, yeah. She also said she thinks things are worse now. Oh God. <laughs> Maybe, I don't like to think, I like to be positive, but oh my God, awful, awful. Hey, when I come on, um, let's have coffee or an apero, okay? And let's talk about, let's talk about. When are you going to be back? Whenever I can get on a plane, Adrian, we've had this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they'll let me in. I have work to do. I need to research. I have so much I need to do. I will be on that plane. You know, of course I would have been there now. I, would, I was thinking October, I don't know. Wait but, until after the election. Uh, Costanza, Costanza, you, we cannot see what you look like. You are totally silhouetted. I, I know because I am, I am, I've changed rooms. My grandnephew just woke up from a nap. I'm in Sardinia in a small apartment and I really wanted to hear this today. Um, so, but it will be better next time. Okay. Or next time I will, I'll be back in Paris. I'll come to you. <laughs> Spies because we can't see your face. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Ah, so much better. Okay. I'm putting my computer down. <laughs> so is Meredith here? Is Meredith Mullins here? Yes. Meredith Mullins? Not here, here, yes, I'm here. I'm in Paris, but I'm here, yes. Hi. 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 I'm just a black box. I prefer to be a black box. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Put up one of your photos. Yeah. One moment. So, <laughs> so um, Kara, which book? I have never read. I'm going to admit, I've never read your books. I've read a lot of other books, um, not mystery or thrillers or whatever, about World War II. Which book do I start with? So I'm going to go out and buy one or order one off of Amazon. <laughs> I can answer that. Oh, let Adrian. Okay, Adrian, uh, tell me. Of course. No. It's <laughs> three hours. Okay. Okay. Wait. 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 <laughs> the crowd is in Paris from from Penelope. You you know when you it'll be in Paris. Of course, but but three hours in Paris. Excuse me. Of course, of course, we have to all read that book. Okay. But if you were going to start the series, you would want to start from the murder in the Marais. Okay, I got you. The beginnings for Kara, because then once you get, when, then you get into it, then you're into it, then you're addicted. Okay. I disagree. <laughs> Penelope back here says she disagrees. She would, but everyone would come to Paris to buy three hours of Paris from the Red Wheelbarrow. Oh, I know that bookstore. Okay, I'll go there. Yeah, because Penelope's right here, and you want to support your local independent bookseller, who's amazing. Um, okay. You know, you go to Penelope's store, which I have often. I hang out with her. I, I get a book. or um, I mean, she even sends books. You send me that huge book, Penelope. It was so wonderful. The Eugene Sue, all the, the old mysteries of Paris. She just sent it to me. I mean, well, if you got free shipping, but... Um, it's really, it's really a wonderful bookstore and it's where writers go, it's where readers go. And if you're nice, you know, you can 
grab Penelope for a drink, you know, just over at Tres Bakery. So she will be gladly go with you. Well, I'll, I'll go to the bookstore so that I can meet her. I will not order off of Amazon, which I really try not to do that. So exactly. I'll go to the Red Wheelbarrow. Support you. your independent booksellers, please. Yep. yep. Just like I support the FNAC for French books. <laughs> It was funny, I remember we were, I don't know, was it last year, the year before, we were at Meredith's, Meredith's house. Mary was there, Adrian, and if other people were there, and I don't see you, forgive me. Um, remember we were talking? I think I had just finished the last, it's the writer's group, what had I finished the last copy edit on? I can't remember. I remember just dropping into Meredith's, you know, big, it's like a sunken living room, isn't it? Or something, something strange in your apartment. <laughs> <Great nice>. <laughs> and it was so fun, you know, to just go there and go, ah, oh, you know, I think I had finished a, a, the last, I don't remember, but it was some great thing. And I was all excited about that. And, but um, yeah, I love that you have that writing group in Paris, right? That's thanks to Mary Duncan. Mary, say hello so we can see you. Can you see her? I saw her before. Yeah, she was on before. She might yeah. be gone. Yeah. I'm yeah. here. She's there you here? Are. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, yeah. Hoping to, I'm hoping to get back there in October, so I'll let you know. Yeah. Do you remember that, Mary? We had, it, was a, well, it was a wonderful evening. Yeah, it was the Paris Writers Group. That's right. And I was with Heather from Secrets of Paris. Right, Heather? Yeah, Heather I was, was with there. Paris. I met Heather's boyfriend, who's a cop. It was fantastic. <laughs> Remember? Oh, he is so cute. She really got a good one. I tell you, it's so. Uh... And the sunken living room, I must say, is where the oven. My apartment was a 1620 patisserie bakery, boulangerie, and the sunken living room is where the uh, the stove was, the oven was. Really? No wonder it felt like a hot seat. No. <laughs> Okay. May, may I suggest at this point that uh, we go to gallery view and everybody can unmike and talk and we can have a free for all for the next few minutes. Unless there's something else you specifically want to say, Kara? No, um, just let me know and I will send book plates to Penelope. I will just inscribe them <laughs> and if um, yeah, is that okay? I'll just send a bunch to her. To the red wheelbarrow, so when you pick up your book, you can put your little signed book plate in there. Sound good? That's great. And Penelope's got books for everybody here who can buy them here, and then they can get the book plates uh, from her later. The signed plates. Signed plates, yeah. And if anyone has any other questions before we open up the free-for-all? <laughs> It looks like you're good, girl. Thank you so, so, so much. I think everybody should give it. Thank you. You. <laughs> for being here uh, long distance and for like being our guinea pig for this crazy Zoom live situation that we had no idea if it was gonna work or not. And I think it worked fairly well. Yeah, yeah the, crowd, the crowd here is pretty happy, OK? And so I'm going to just put on a gallery view now so that what we see on the screen is everybody. There you go. Yeah, and I just want to say, if, if none of you follow Patty Sadukas, Sadukas, I'll get it wrong, Patty. Yes, on Paris, on a dime, watch uh, when she goes to Nîmes on Facebook. I love her, you know, all those pictures from her window, going to the market. She said, don't you get tired? I go, no, never. I get, never get tired of it. It's genuinefrance.com. And I'm going to plug Patty for just a moment because Patty designs these fabulous masks, okay, that with her photos, and you can order them directly on her website. So it's genuinefrance.com. She's so cute, so cute. Well, Patty, unmute and say hello. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do too while you're having this free-for-all and anybody can say anything, anyone who wants to come up and say hello?
from here. I'm going to leave my cup. Okay. So it's all yours. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I thought this was super wonderful. I love the Zoom because I'm not in France. And so thank you so much. I think this is one of the good things that came out of COVID. You have a great day. Hi, Carl. Hey, everyone. Hi. Hi, Janet. How are you? Good. Come over here. I know. I was going to come visit you in Champagne, remember? And, uh, you know, after. I know. So, anyway, this was wonderful as usual. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah. 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 Sure. April. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, Kara. I really enjoyed today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to meeting you um, when you're next in Paris. And I really wanted to say hi to David and Sherry. Hi, bonjour. Mm -hmm. Miss you guys. <laughs> Hope everyone's well. Keep being safe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. April, April, April. Yes. We've thought about you. We, in fact, we were just talking about you the other day and hoping that you were well and that your business was doing good and you were keeping uh, busy. Thank you. I'll, I'll send you an email when I get home this evening and tell you okay. everything. Okay. okay. Great. Nice. Good to see you. Thank you again, Tara. Thank you. you. I, have a, I have a question for Patty. Is there any place uh, here in the States that I can get the documentary Meeting Jim? Documentary? <laughs> Wait, Patty's coming back. Okay. Here. Here. No, here, this is your hot spot. This is your hot spot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, Patty, you, uh, you were kind enough to send uh, a link or where I could actually uh, see Meeting Jim, the documentary. I'm not able to access that. Uh, is there any place here in the States that I can uh, purchase uh, or oh, dear, access dear. Meeting Jim? I uh, had the occasion to have one of his lovely dinners at his ETA in uh, 2005. So well, I, I would love to see that documentary. When we show Meeting Jim. Oh, right. Right. We're showing it next month. Right. We're, we're showing Meeting Jim next month. Meeting Jim. And so you'll have to uh, zoom in for that one. Oh, right. will, right you be, will you be zooming in October as well? Perhaps. Yeah. More than likely. Uh, the oh, truth, is, the no. truth is, I have to get permission. In order to do that, I have to have permissions from the producers. Uh, and you're Judy. You're talking about Jim Haynes, yes. the American who lives in the 14th arrondissement, and yes. is famous and started the Edinburgh Fringe Festival or whatever. Yes. Yeah. I, I met know. him. I met him on more than one occasion. Yes, lovely man. Yeah, and he's hanging in there. Hey, David, I didn't see you there. The Finkelsteins, I didn't oh, even how are you? notice you. I'm sorry. You, you made it, it, I haven't told Sherry, you at least made me want to reread the book. <laughs> we, we got it as soon as it came out. Oh, and so, so but been a long time. visiting with you today makes me want to reread it. <laughs> I know, I'm surprised I'm not seeing you in Paris because I saw you last time at the American Church with Craig and yeah. everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. We were all there last yeah. Lisa and Sato. Right. Right. And where are you now? Where are you now? We moved back to the States in November. It was just time to come home with family and everything. So we live on the plaza in Kansas City. Uh, actually, um, uh, Patty was here for at Christmas. Oh. Stopped by with her with her sister in our apartment in Christmas. So it was good to see her and. Uh, what about a month after Patty was here? We finally got all of our things from Paris, so now <laughs> our home looks like all the things that we brought from Paris. So it was, it's been great. Nice seeing you. Hey, Greg. It's hard. I just wanted to say I got your book and I can't wait to read it. Wait a <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Well, I've been watching the renovations on your restaurant, and you've been living there, haven't you? I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. No, no, that's Adrian. That's Adrian, not me. That's Adrian. Oh, I know. I know. That's a big pancakes. Thank you. But here I go. I can't wait to read this. Oh, thank you, Craig. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoy it.
Adrian, Adrian, are you going to Zoom October at Prime Midi? I'm sorry, your question is what? Are you, are you going to Zoom October at Prime Midi? I just explained that I'm not 100% sure because I'll need permission from the producers oh. for showing the documentary. And it might be a bit complicated, so I'm not sure about it. It's just keep us informed. <laughs> This was the first time we've ever attempted to do anything like this. And can you hear the noise in the background? Yes. Yes. We have our own free for all going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've attended at least three in person at Premedy, and I was so happy when you did this. Um, well, you last month you did, or no, not um, July when you did uh, the remote. I cannot hear anything at all. Oh, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> but I, I would like to uh, really thank Kara for making this fabulous presentation and being our guinea pig. And we miss her terribly. We wish she were here live, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to mute myself here, but I'm going to let everybody go until 5 o'clock. This will be, this is recorded. We will make it available so everybody can watch it later. Okay? So I want to thank everybody participating. We have had more than 100 people on, plus the 20 or so that we have missed, so it's very exciting. And we hope that everybody can get to Paris very, very, very soon. Uh, so how can we stay in touch between me? Okay. I'm gonna, if there's nothing else for me, I'm gonna say goodbye. Does anyone wanna ask me anything else quickly? Or? It was nice to see you, Kara. <laughs> yeah, see you in Paris, Kara. I know, I'll see you all as soon as I can get there. Yeah, it was yeah. a pleasure, you. it was a pleasure meeting you, Kara. I hope to yeah. see you in Paris. You in Paris. Okay, really. No, really. When you get, when we're both in Paris, we're going out for a drink. I want to hear your stories, okay? <laughs> well, you can contact me via email. Let me know when you're coming because I go around quite a bit. I get around between, I'm hoping also to get to the States. So email me, no problem. Okay, I'm really bad at that. So if I don't email you, just go to my website, carablack.com too, because you know what I mean? I can't really, you, I'm bad at that. So anyone who wants to go, you know, meet, meet up sometime in Paris, email or check my, you know, website and we'll, we'll hook up. And you know? on, on your website, you will say when, when, on your website, you will say when you're coming over and then we can reach you that way. Is that the idea? Thank you. I don't okay. always advertise when I'm coming, but I, I always say I'm doing an event in Paris, um, you know, uh, so I don't, you know, I only want to, you know, it's between us, right? Between Adrian's people. Those, you guys are special. I don't just always meet random people, okay? <laughs> right? Because you're special. So um, we'll figure it okay, out. Okay. Well, Kara, I've lived in Paris for 35 years. It's, I've only started meeting Americans in Paris. I've only been with French people. Um, so I've just opened up to, to meeting Americans in, in Paris. My whole life has been very, very French and Italian, so. And here's Devorah. My parents are Holocaust survivors. My father wrote a book about his experiences. Wow. My book about a Syrian refugee is almost ready for publishing. My parents are Holocaust survivors from Hungary and Romania. Well, we all have to get together and have a big get together. Wow. So interesting. It's hard when you're talking and trying to talk about things and then to read the comments. But thank you for everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all in person. And um, à tout à l'heure. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.
Thank you. 